church processions banned in Nicaragua, the latest clampdown by President Daniel Ortega as he seeks to prevent anti-government unrest. Opposed by the U.S. and accused of human rights abuses, Ortega has also moved closer to China and Russia. So what's next for Nicaragua? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Fully Batibo. Daniel Ortega is one of Latin America's great political survivors. The leftist guerrilla leader who seized power after toppling a right-wing U.S.-backed regime in 1979 accepted defeat in elections in 1990, but he was voted back as president in 2006 and has been in the top job since after three further elections. During this time, he's been accused of increased repression and has been ostracized by the U.S. and its Western allies. Demonstrations which began five years ago marked the start of the crackdown on dissent. Victoria Gatenby has the background. When President Daniel Ortega tried to cut welfare benefits to reduce the deficit in 2018, people responded with anger and protests. The reforms were later dropped, but the demonstrations intensified into a movement against Ortega and his government. In the months that followed, Ortega ordered a crackdown targeting human rights groups, journalists and activists. At least 300 Nicaraguans were killed and tens of thousands were forced into exile. Ortega faced widespread international condemnation. The UN said there was evidence of extrajudicial killings, torture and arbitrary detentions. The US placed new sanctions on Nicaragua. Washington in the past backed and armed the Contras in neighboring Honduras who sought and failed to overthrow Ortega. Today the US says he's a dictator. Recently, Ortega formed closer ties with Russia and China. He's called for the expulsion of Taiwan as an observer of the Central American integration system and wants Russia to join the bloc. That Yankee military base called Taiwan or Taipei, that Yankee military base must be withdrawn, expelled from the Central American integration system. In Nicaragua, tension between the Catholic Church and Ortega remains. Ortega accuses priests of backing the 2018 protests. I can tell you that faith is the last thing we Catholics are going to lose here in Nicaragua. It's the last thing. If we carry it with us, we will be able to do anything. Ortega's Sandinista's socialist movement was supported by many on the left worldwide when it seized power from the US-backed right-wing Somoza in 1979. He retains a core of loyal support in the country from those revolutionary days, but is accused by opponents of using repression to stay in power. Victoria Gatenby for Inside Story. Well, Daniel Ortega is now in the 17th year of his second stint as Nicaragua's leader. This is his fourth consecutive term as president since 2007, despite leading an unpopular government. Ortega came to power as a commander in the Sandinista guerrilla movement, which overthrew Nicaragua's dictatorship in 1979. He became president in 1985. In 1990, he lost power, but he stood for and won the presidency in 2006, taking office in January 2007. He's been president ever since. He's consolidated his control, using force to silence dissent, while elevating his wife and loyalists to high positions. Poverty, natural disasters and the pandemic led to a mass exodus of people from Nicaragua to the border with the United States over the past few years. Ortega has been blamed for not doing enough to strengthen the economy. Well, plenty then to discuss with our guests. Joining us from Managua is Ben Norton, who's an investigative journalist and editor-in-chief of Geopolitical Economy Report, a Nicaraguan news website. From Los Angeles in the U.S., we're joined by Astrid Montealegre, who's supervising attorney for the Nicaraguan American Human Rights Alliance, and Dan Kovalik, a human rights lawyer and author of Nicaragua, a history of U.S. intervention and resistance. Is joining us from Pittsburgh. Thank you so much for joining us on Inside Story. A warm welcome to you all. Ben, if I can start with you in Managua, 
You say, Ben, that there's a lot of disinformation on Nicaragua. So can you start off by telling us the reality of the situation in the country today? What is happening? Absolutely. We have to understand what's going on in Nicaragua today in the historical context of Latin America. For 200 years, this is the anniversary of the so-called Monroe Doctrine, in which the United States has treated Latin America as its proverbial backyard, or Joe Biden recently said front yard, but it shows this very arrogant mentality in which, unfortunately, Washington has not tolerated many independent governments in the region, especially left-wing governments. Cuba has been under sanctions and under a blockade for more than 60 years by the United States, and every single year at the United Nations, the entire world except the U.S. condemns that blockade. And in the case of Nicaragua, it's a very similar history. You mentioned some of that history, including the U.S. support for the Contras, these right-wing violent guerrillas that tried to overthrow the government in the 1980s. And right now, Nicaragua is suffering under unilateral sanctions imposed by the U.S. in violation of international law. So this brings us to 2018. 2018 was a violent coup attempt, and there have been many coup attempts and coups across Latin America. In fact, the coup in 2019 in Bolivia against the indigenous left-wing president Evo Morales, which was also backed by the Trump administration, was very similar to what was attempted here in Nicaragua in 2018. Unfortunately, there, there were hundreds of deaths. It's very tragic. But those were deaths on both sides. So when, when we talk about the deaths in 2018, we're mm. also talking about Sandinista activists and police officers who were killed. In the case of a very famous police officer named Gabriel Vado Ruiz, there's a park here named after him. He was kidnapped and tortured, and his body was set on fire by these right-wing insurgents in the coup attempt in 2018. Unfortunately, we never hear the names of those victims. It's portrayed as a one-sided crackdown on protests, when in reality, there were protests, right. that were, but there were also violent forces who were trying to overthrow the government. Okay, but what is the reality of the situation in the country today in terms of the economy, in terms of human rights? You're in uh, Nicaragua. Tell us about what's happening. And are there credible achievements that the uh, international community is being, is not uh, uh, seeing and is ignoring, perhaps? Well, when we talk about the economy in Nicaragua, we have to always consider that, at least according to nominal GDP, this is the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere after Haiti. Yet, despite that, the social services of the Sandinista government are pretty incredible. I'm originally from the United States. I've lived here for several years. In the United States, there's no free universal health care and education. Here, despite the lack of resources, education is written into the Constitution, created since the Sandinistas came back, that education is a right, a guaranteed right, mm -hmm. higher education, as well as all levels of health care. I have friends whose parents had cancer, and they got cancer treatment for free, whereas in the United okay. States, which is a very wealthy country, the most common cause of bankruptcy is medical bills. In okay. addition, there are also significant social services. Right now, the Sandinista government is, is spending large amounts of money with the support from its allies to build tens of thousands of public housing units to give housing to poor and working people. So mm -hmm. compared to the rest of the region in Central America, Nicaragua is also the safest country in the region, okay. whereas but El Salvador then that, that at the same Honduras, time, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ben. I mean, you paint a, a, you know, a picture there of, you know, a, a thriving, what looks like a thriving Nicaragua anyway, when you talk about the social services, but that doesn't explain why there are so many Nicaraguans leaving the country. I think 180,000 crossed into the United States in the uh, first 11 months of just last year. I'll come back to that uh, in just a moment and ask you why. Why people then, if, if things are not as bad as the Western world is uh, painting them, why are then Nicaraguans leaving? But I want to bring uh, Dan and uh, Astrid into the conversation. Dan, I, I want to uh, ask you about a point, uh, Ben, made uh, about 2018 and the protests there. Uh, he said that was an attempted coup, and this is what Ortega has claimed as well, an attempted coup by, by foreign uh, backers. Uh, are there any um, credible... Uh, is there any credibility to those claims? Well, absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. in fact, I mean, the opposition was very vocal about what they wanted. When uh, Daniel Ortega very quickly announced a peace dialogue to end the crisis, you had uh leaders of the opposition including the catholic church calling for daniel ortega to immediately step down and by the way 
this is uh, a president, Danny Ortega, who a few months before had an 80 percent approval rate. OK, so and they're calling for him to step down. They were very clear that that's what they wanted. And as Ben noted, you had at least 22 By police they, officers. You mean, you were, mean the Americans? They, I mean, the opposition with the support of the United States. Yes. In fact, uh, the U.S., uh, there was this interesting magazine, uh, Global Reports, I think it was what it was called, uh, that said that the U.S. helped um, helped incite the insurrection in 2018. The U.S. gave millions of dollars to these opposition groups and supported this violent coup against the government. Mm -hmm. And it should be noted, by the way, I, I'm a practicing Roman Catholic, okay? But the Catholic Church in Nicaragua is incredibly reactionary. They were part of the coup. There were caches of arms found in various churches. Uh, various priests oversaw torture in the churches. I met one man who lost his arm after being tortured in, in the church that he attended. Um, so this is not about repressing the church or repressing civil institutions. This is about a coup attempt that was violent, that killed uh, the statistic I saw was something like 220 people died during the insurrection, and it was about 50-50 mm -hmm. on both sides, Okay, 22 police officers, and that created billions of dollars in property destruction and, yes, damaged the economy. Um, which, of course, was followed by several rounds of economic sanctions by the United States, okay. which, yes, have done damage to the economy of Nicaragua. Astrid, let me bring you into the conversation because you work with Nicaraguans who are seeking asylum uh, in the U.S. and their journey to a new life is often a very difficult one. Uh, talk to us about their experiences, what they tell you is driving them to leave the country. Yes, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'd like to mention that despite the allegations that there's been some sort of coup from the right, I must point out that many of the political prisoners that were recently released by the Ortega regime were, in fact, members of the left-leaning ideology ideological political party, MRS, um, which is not um, by any stretch of the imagination right or right-leaning. Um, for one instance. For the second instance, in terms of the social services that are available in Nicaragua and the respect for the rule of law, um, yes, public education is a social services as well as health care, but I uh, would like to venture into the quality of both. Um, I have lived in Nicaragua. I have raised my children in Nicaragua, and I understand the limited very limited quality, both in social and educational services available from the government. And also, I'd like to point out that the sanctions are not unilateral. They're not only directed towards the government. They're actually directed towards specific people who have been accused by witnesses and victims in international tribunals for violations of human rights and for violations of their express right to travel freely within and outside of the country. There have been hundreds of formal state employees who have not been allowed the right to leave the country simply for the fact that they are government employees. And I myself have encountered these people on a daily basis. So I would like to know what is the justification that the quote-unquote legitimate government of Nicaragua provides for having its own people held captive. Okay, Ben, uh, Ben, would you like to answer that? Because I saw that you were disagreeing with what uh, Astrid was saying there. What is the justification uh, the government is giving for arresting all these people? There are several points that were very misleading. First of all, the so-called MRS party, previously known as the Movement for the Renovation of Sandinismo, has never been a left-wing party. It was created in 1994 by the right-wing split out of the Sandinista party after they lost power in 1990, and they explicitly opposed socialism. If you read their opening statement, they explicitly opposed anti-imperialism. And then they immediately formed an alliance with the right-wing in Nicaragua, including the oligarch Eduardo Montelegre. So that's a completely false claim. Uh, se secondly, the claim that the health 
and and education are of low quality. I mean, uh, that's absolutely ridiculous. Again, we have to compare apples to oranges. Nicaragua is a poor country, but when you compare Nicaragua to its neighbors, you can't compare Nicaragua to the United States, which is a country that became rich through wars and slavery and ethnic cleansing of indigenous peoples. Can't Compared compare to its neighbors, to Nicaragua's absolutely Nicaragua's social services are significantly better than a country like Haiti or Honduras. I mean, it's a preposterous comparison. Furthermore, but then what is, I mean, what is the, driving people to leave then, Ben? What, what is driving people to leave? Is it the fear of the Ortega government it, or is it the econo economic situation of the country that's forcing people to leave? I have studied U.S. immigration statistics very closely, and the immigrant outflow of Nicaraguans is very recent. Until a few years ago, the vast majority of immigrants from Central America were from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Something changed very recently, about a year ago, and that was that the U.S. government publicly said that people from Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela are welcome in the United States because the United States, the spokeswoman for the Biden administration Speaking claimed Jeff, that they were fleeing the communism. have increased exponentially since 2018. These numbers have not gone up from last year. I'm sorry, Ben, that is clearly just untrue. These numbers have gone up since 2018, and the humanitarian parole was in direct response to those numbers. Okay, Dan, uh, there was a maybe slight you want to jump increase. In. There was a slight increase after 2018 because there were people who were fleeing because, again, there was violence and instability fueled by the United States and other countries and a violent right wing opposition. But especially in the past year, the number of immigrants has significantly Sorry, increased United because not the Biden the administration was saying publicly. Beat reporters. <laughs> okay, Dan, uh, please, please join then. us in this conversation. Uh, th there's, of course, yes, a lot of back yes, and forth so there between Ben and Astrid. Let me just ask you, Dan, because yeah. you're a human rights lawyer. What has changed yeah, since well, 2018? I think, again, what did change after 2018 were several things. Uh, as Ben mentioned, of course, people were upset about the violence and instability over the summer. Um, but also, the economy was greatly hurt by... The, um, by the insurrection, which, of course, targeted the economy. The opposition set up all these tranques, these barricades around the country. Thousands were set up that undermined the economy, prevented commerce, even international commerce. There were truckers going from you know, Honduras uh, to Costa Rica that were stuck in Nicaragua. It was intended to hurt the economy, it did. And then the U.S. piled on with sanctions. The barricades so, were of not course, the economy, the economy. The barricades were intended of to course protect they the were. people uh, wait, who were hiding. Uh, can I say something? Can arms. I say something? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, it, you may. Go, go ahead, go ahead Dan. Finish, the and then, and then you'll, you'll get to respond, Astrid. No. Go yeah, ahead, Dan. Let me please. say something. They were intended to hurt the economy. They have. And, of course, this is, a, this is a very typical tactic of blaming the victim. The U.S. imposes sanctions to hurt the economy. It hurts the economy. And then the U.S. says, oh, look, you have a troubled economy. Meanwhile, let me just point out a couple things. You know, you asked about, you know, some of the good things happening in Nicaragua. The U.N. has ranked Nicaragua the seventh highest country in terms of gender equality on earth. Seventh, the U.S. and U.K. aren't even in the top 10, which is an incredible achievement. Okay. Ben mentioned that Nicaragua has, has, has historically been the second poorest country um, in Latin America. In fact, it's now the third poorest. Honduras is now the second poorest after the U.S. back coup in 2009. Um, so, you know, the U.S. is very happy to overthrow governments, install dictatorships like it did in Honduras 2009, like it helped do in Peru this year. Um, and those countries are not isolated. And I think that's very important to point out. Okay, Astrid, uh, you can respond now. Both Ben and Dan say the picture is not as bleak as the U.S. and its Western allies paint it to be, that they are, there have been some achievements under Ortega. Uh, what do you say to that? I say that if that were the case, we wouldn't be on this show today talking about the hundreds of thousands of Nicaraguan exiles who have fled Nicaragua, not just to the U.S., but Europe, 
Costa Rica, and the rest of the world as well. Also, I would say that the economy and economics is no reason to turn a blind eye to human rights. You should know that, Dan. We, we're where we are today because of what the world has done in response to World War II. And there's no reason why we should turn a blind eye to human rights violations in the name of an economy. And yes, the Nicaraguan people may very well be happy. That does not mean that they're not being abused by the government that is meant to protect them. But I just want to broaden out the conversation a bit and, Dan, bring you into it. Uh, we've seen Nicaragua now increasingly turning to China and Russia, lots of agreements with the Chinese and the Russians. What can they, what can Ortega get out of, uh, of those relationships? Well, first of all, I, I think it's fair to say that Nicaragua was forced to turn to China and Russia because of U.S. economic sanctions, right? Which have cut off international financing from Nicaragua, which, by the way, it was using for social programs. In fact, the World Bank and IMF had applauded the Sandinista government's use of IMF funds for those purposes. So, of course, when your financing's cut off, when you have trouble getting the U.S. dollar because of sanctions, you're going to have to turn to other currencies in other countries. That's exactly what Danny Ortega has done, and he's hoping now he'll get real development help from China and from Russia, have new economic trading partners, and again, maybe be able to wean Nicaragua off the U.S. dollar, which the U.S. uses to dominate other countries just like Nicaragua. And this is happening around the world. The U.S. right now has about one-third of the world's population under sanctions. And given that, and again, all that is the U.S. is able to do through dollar dom dominance, through so-called dollar diplomacy, which goes back to Will President William Howard Taft. And so countries like Nicaragua have no choice but to seek trading partners outside the U.S. sphere of influence. But of course, when they do that, when the U.S. forces them to do it, then the U.S. blames them for doing it. Again, this is classic. This is exactly what happened during the country war where, of course, Nicaragua was forced to turn to the Soviet Union for help, and then the U.S. blamed them for turning to the Soviet Union. Okay. This is Astrid, uh, your a thoughts classic about this. situation. Astrid, yeah. your thoughts about this? Nicaragua and China signing a series of strategic agreements, uh, trade programs, and so on. How much of a concern is this to, to uh, the U.S., and is this going to help Nicaragua in any way, you think? Financially speaking, in terms of economics, of course, it makes total sense that Nicaragua would reach out and diversify in terms of making its economy sustainable. Any country and every country should do that. We shouldn't rely on any other single sole partner. Um, that's just basic economics. However, allowing another country to have sovereignty within your territory and giving them access to specific territories that might give them uh, upper hand in terms of security measures or defense measures when talking to the U.S. Now, that's something else. When we're talking about if Russia or China were to have sovereign territory within Nicaragua, they're within missile range of the United States. Ben? But, but wait, what? can I say something to that? First of all, there's no, I haven't heard any question that they're going to give territory to Russia and China. And if they want a military alliance with those countries, they are free to they do want, that. They want a military alliance the with, U with the wait, Chinese. Wait, Astrid, let me finish. The U.S. has military bases throughout Latin America, has numerous bases throughout Latin America. Why does the U.S. get the right to do that? And uh, a country can't invite a China, a Russia, or any other country to have a military base if they want it. Right to do uh, it. Not that I'm saying that's going to happen in Nicaragua, the but the United point States is, the point is, you, you are security. speaking not— Wait, Astrid, the, a country is allowed to do that. I'm sorry. I know you like the Monroe Doctrine, obviously, but since you're saying they can't partner with other countries out, you know, aside from the U.S., but that's not how sovereignty works. Function, sir. Sovereignty mm -hmm. means you can partner with whoever you want, and they're allowed okay. to partner even militarily. Ben, with let another me ask country. you about the partnership. Okay. Was, whether oh. it was sovereign or not, the question was whether it was in the interest of the United States and what this implied for the United no, States. No, she said in the There's interest no issue of Nicaragua. Of whether it's Who sovereign cares if it's or in not? Uh, okay. No one cares if it's in the interest Ladies of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, States. please, it's not their please. Business.
let's yeah. let's try and, and keep things a bit more uh, calmer. Ben, let me come to you and ask you about the relationship with China and Russia. Uh, Astrid says, yes, if it helps Nicaragua's economy, why not? But Nicaragua needs to be careful about this uh, these uh, strategic uh, relationships, so-called strategic relationships. So what, what, what is your thought about this? Well, first of all, I just want to stress that there has been absolutely no indication whatsoever that Nicaragua has even for a second considered giving some of its territory to any foreign country. I should point out that actually the United States well, has militarily occupied Nicaragua. The, the U.S. has militarily occupied Nicaragua on three different occasions. So, I mean, this is complete projection. But in terms of China and Russia, the relationship is a no-brainer. Here's an example. This week, right now while we're speaking, the head of China's International Development Agency visited Nicaragua and inaugurated a public housing community in which China is helping Nicaragua build 12,000 public housing units for poor and working Nicaraguans. The United States has a USAID, the U.S. Agency for International Development, which in the 1980s was used to send weapons to the Contras on so-called humanitarian aid flights. That was reported by The New York Times. And since then, USAID has given its so-called development funding to exclusively right-wing opposition organizations against the government. So for, for Nicaragua, it's a no-brainer. China, through its Belt and Road Initiative, which Nicaragua is now part of, is building infrastructure in many countries in the Global South, including uh, public housing units for poor people, and Nicaragua and China are building an interoceanic canal to challenge the monopoly of the Panama Canal, and that's going to bring a huge rise in economic growth to China and more international commerce. So that's why it makes perfect sense for Nicaragua to work with China. And then, of course, their governments are both led by socialist parties, so there are ideological similarities. But, mm. I mean, the idea that Nicaragua is going to give up its territory is absurd, considering that there's no indication of that whatsoever. And furthermore, in Honduras, Nicaragua's northern neighbor, the largest right. U.S. military base in the Americas is in Honduras, the Sotocano Air Base. OK, Astrid, I'll give you the last word. Ortega's supporters has said all along that he's been standing up to bullying from the West and that he, he actually uh, is a good thing for, for Nicaragua. So what would you, you know, respond to that? And where next for, for your country? Respond that if that is the case and there is, in fact, the required support for the current government of Nicaragua, then I would ask for an explanation as to why opposition leaders were incarcerated prior to the last elections in 2017, why Nicaraguans have been stripped of their nationality and exiled to the United States. And I've also would ask when and where are the proofs and evidence of this coup that allegedly took place in 2018 that justified the gross violation of human rights, when are those going to be presented to the world? Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you all so much for a very interesting and heated uh, discussion. It was very good to, to hear all three of you on this. Dan Kovalik, Ben Norton, Astrid Montealegre, thank you uh, very much once again for joining us. And thank you as well for watching. You can always watch this program again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can, of course, also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Fuli Batibo, and the whole team here in Doha, Thanks for watching. Bye for now.